Okay, so the last day today on The Butterfly Lion by Michael Morpurgo. So we're reading chapter 13 and chapter 14. The old lady turned to me and smiled. There, she said, that's my story. And what about Bertie? I knew as I asked that I shouldn't have, but I had to know. He's dead, dear, the old lady replied. It's what happens when you get old. It's nothing to worry about. It's lonely, though. That's why I've got Jack. And Bertie, like his lion, lived on to a good age. He's buried out there under the hill beside the white prince. She looked back at the hill for a moment. And that's where I belong too, she said. She tapped the table with her fingers. Come on, time to go back to school with you before they miss you and you get yourself into trouble. We wouldn't want that, would we? She laughed. Do you know, that's just what I told Bertie all those years ago when he ran away from school. You remember? She was on her feet now. Come on, I'll drive you. And don't look so worried. I'll make sure no one sees you. It'll be like you ne you've never been gone. Can I come again? I asked. Of course you can, she said. I may not always be easy to find, but I'll be here. I'll just tidy away the tea things and then we'll go, shall we? It was a very old-fashioned car, black and upright and dignified, with a leathery smell and a whiny... She dropped me at the bottom of the school park by the fence. Take care, dear, she said, and be sure to come back again soon, won't you? I'll be expecting you. I will, I replied. I climbed the fence before I turned to wave, but by that time the car had gone. To my huge relief, no one had missed me. And best of all, Basher Beaumont was in the sick room. He'd gone down with measles. I just hoped his measles would last a very long time. All through supper, I could think of nothing but Bertie Andrews and his white lion. Stew and dumplings and then semolina pudding with raspberry jam. Again. It was as I was picking my way through my slimy semolina that I remembered Bertie Andrews had been at this school. Maybe, I thought maybe he had had to sit here and eat slimy semolina just as we did now. I looked up at the honours boards around the dining hall, at the names of all the boys who had won scholarships over the years. I looked for Bertie Andrews. He wasn't there. But then I thought, why should he be? Maybe, like me, he wasn't brilliant at his schoolwork. Not everyone wins scholarships. Cookie, Mr Cook, my history teacher, was sitting beside me at the end of the table. Who were you looking for, Morpurgo? He asked suddenly. Guys, I'm just going to stop there. Who is the boy? Who were you looking for, Morpurgo? The boy telling the story is Michael Morpurgo, so the author of the book. Okay. Andrews, sir, I said. Bertie Andrews. 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 There's an Albert Andrews who won the Victoria Cross in the First World War. Do you mean him? Cookie scraped his bowl clean and licked the back of his spoon. I love raspberry jam. You'll find his name in the chapel under the east window under the war memorial. But he wasn't killed in the war, you know. He lived down at Strawbridge, that place with the lion on the gateway, just across the main road. He died maybe 10, 12 years ago, soon after I came to teach here. The only old boy ever to win the Victoria Cross. That's why they put up a memorial plaque to him in the chapel after he died. I remember the day his wife came to unveil it. His widow, I should say. Poor dear. Just herself and the dog in that great big place. She died only a few months later. Broken heart, they say. You can, you know. You can die of a broken heart. That house has been empty ever since. No family to take it on. No one wants it. Too big, you see. It's a shame. I said I wanted to be excused to go to the toilet. I hurtled down the passage, out across the courtyard and into the chapel. The small brass plaque was exactly where Cookie had said it was, but hidden by a vase of flowers. I moved the vase to one side. The plaque read, Albert Andrews, VC. Born 1897, died 1968. An old boy of this school. And the lion shall lie down with the lamb. All night long I tried to puzzle it out. Cookie was wrong. He just had to be. I never slept a wink. The next afternoon, after games were over, I went down the fence went over the fence at the bottom of the park, haired up through Innocent's Breach, across the road, along the wall and slipped through the iron gateway with the stone lion roaring above me. It was raining a light summer rain. I tried knocking at the front door. No one came. No dog barked. I went around to the back and peered in through the kitchen window. The box kite was still on there, was still on the kitchen table, 
but there was no sign of the old lady anywhere. I rattled the kitchen door and knocked louder. Again and again. I called out, Hello? Hello? There was no reply. I banged on the window. Are you there? Are you there? We all are, came a voice from behind me. I turned. There was no one there. I was alone. Alone with the white lion on the hillside. I'd imagined it. I climbed the hill and went to sit on the grass above the white lion's mane. I looked down at the great house beneath me. Jackdaws cawed overhead. There was bracken and grass growing out of the gutters and around the chimney pots. Some of the windows were boarded up. Drain pipes hung loose and rustling. And rusting, sorry. The place was empty. Quite empty. The rain suddenly stopped and the sun warmed the back of my neck. The first butterfly landed on my arm. It was blue. Adonis blue, Adonis blue, came the voice again, like an echo in my head. Then the sky around me was filled with butterflies and they were set, settling to drink on the chalk. Adonis blues, remember? The same voice, a real voice, her voice. And this time I knew it was not in my head. Keep him white for us. There's a dear. We don't want him forgotten, you see. And think of us sometimes, won't you? I will, I cried, I will. And I swear, I felt the say, I felt the earth tremble beneath me with the roar of a distant lion. Okay, that's the end of the story, guys. Okay, before we go on to the questions for today, I want you to think about that very first page, the first day we had a look at this book, the first lesson, I want you to think about that first page, the page that wasn't the start of the story. Do you remember, Michael Morpurgo had written it and he told us about where he got his inspiration from for this book. Okay, have a think about that. Think about, now we know that the boy is Michael Morpurgo. He said running away from school had inspired him. So he is the boy in this story, okay? Have a think, have a read back if you've got it in front of you. Have a read back about the other things because it said another thing that inspired him was that big chalk horse that was on the a hillside somewhere in the UK. So he'd obviously got inspiration from that to create a chalk lion on the hillside. Like I said at the time, if you have a read back through that now, that one page, it makes a lot more sense now you've read this book. Okay, so if you've got time, try and do that as well. So your questions. Why did Millie say she had Jack? Where is Bertie buried? Where was Basher Beaumont when the boy returned to school? And why was he there? What was there in the chapel to remember Bertie? And what is the definition of the word widow? And that's used on the, word, on the page 113. You might, for that, want to use a dictionary if you don't know, or ask one of your grown-ups. Okay, there's your sentence stems. Pause. Okay, and your answers. Millie said she had Jack to keep her company as she was lonely. Bertie is buried under the hill next to the lion. Basher Beaumont was in the sick room because he had gone down with measles. There was a memorial plaque in the chapel to remember Bertie. And the definition of a widow is a woman who has lost her husband by death and has not married again. So in this case, Millie is a widow as Bertie died before she did. Okay, so your three brain power questions. On page 110, the boy asks to visit Millie again. Why do you think that is? Question seven. Why did the boy think Cookie was wrong? What had he said that had confused him? And question eight. Who do you think the voices were that the boy heard on page 116 and 117? Pause and have a go at answering, and then we will look at them together. Okay, well done. So, why do you think that he asks to visit Millie again? So, we've underlined, said, can I come again? There's no one thing or no one piece of evidence. If you just think back through the whole of the book that we've read, why do you think that he would want to visit again? He liked the scones. But I, I think it's more than that. I don't think it's because he wanted more scones. I think it's because he enjoyed hearing the story. I also think he saw a likeness, a similarity. Okay, so he identified with Bertie. 
okay? Because if you think back, we know that Bertie was trying to escape school, as is Morpurgo, Michael Morpurgo, in this story. He's trying to escape school. And if you look at it, Michael, um, Bertie went back to the house every, day, every week, every Sunday. This is what Michael Morpurgo wants to do. And Michael Morpurgo is holding out hope because Bertie's life ended really well in the end, okay? As Millie said earlier in the story, there are clouds and bad times in life, but eventually the sun will shine through. The clouds will move and the sun will come. Okay, so I think he's keeping that in his head. On page 113, it's not so much 115 actually, so don't worry about that, 113. Why did the boy think Cookie was wrong? What did he, what did Cookie say here that confused him? Because bearing in mind, he'd just come from Millie's house. Okay, so he tells Michael Morpurgo that the day his wife came to unveil it, his widow, which we've just looked at what widow means, the poor dear, just herself and the dog came to unveil it and just herself and the dog were in that great big place. She died only a few months later. I think that is what has confused Michael Morpurgo. Okay. Because he's just got back from Millie's house. Okay. Millie wasn't dead. Millie was very much there, as was the dog. So that is what has confused him. And it's made him question whether or not that was real or whether or not it was a ghost. Okay. Also, you might have picked up, guys, may or may not have picked up, it says here, broken heart, they say, you know, you can die for a broken heart. Someone else says that earlier in the story, can you remember who? Yeah, that's right, so Bertie, when he was telling Millie originally that his mum had died, and we talked about it in one of the other lessons, Bertie said that his mum, she died of malaria, but Bertie thought she died of a broken heart. And Dad said, you can die of a broken heart. Okay. Also, oh no, we've talked about that. And then the last question. So who do you think the voices were that the boy heard on pages 116 and 117? So we've got there. We've got there came the voice again Adonis Blues the same voice a real voice her voice so they're saying I think the voices that the boy heard were the voices of I think she says we all are came a voice from behind me it doesn't tell us who that voice was whether it was the lady whether it was Millie whether it was Bertie okay but we can see and we can hear that whoever says Adonis Blues, Adonis Blues, Adonis Blues, remember, it says here, her voice. So we know that that is Millie's voice. Okay. Keep him white for us. There's a dear. We don't want him forgotten, you see. And think of us sometimes, won't you? Okay. So there was nobody there, but he could hear the voices. That's interesting. What's your take on that? Do you think that they're ghosts? Do you think that they're dead or alive? It would be interesting to see. Guys, I've really enjoyed reading that book with you. Like I said at the start, it's a book that I've not read before and I've really enjoyed reading it and learning about it. I hope you have too. Hi class four, hope you're all okay and you've had a lovely weekend ready to start our maths today. So today we're going to be looking at exploring comparing data. So to start off with I'm just going to remind ourselves about the key for pictograms. So if a full circle represents 20 children, how many children as represented by three quarters of a circle, half a circle and a quarter of a circle. Pause me while you think about it and then come back when you're ready. Okay, hopefully you've had a go at that. So 
I would start off by thinking if a full circle represents 20, half of my circle would be half of 20, which is 10. And then a quarter is half of that again, so half of 10 is 5. And three quarters is our half and our quarter added together, so that becomes 15. Well done if you got that. Okay, have a look at the table there. So it's got the day of the week and then the number of tickets sold. How many more tickets were sold on Thursday than Monday? Okay, so you're going to be looking at Thursday here and Monday. And you want to know how many more tickets were sold on Thursday than Monday. Okay, have a go at working that out and then come back when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully you would have thought that Thursday's got 75, Monday's got 55, so you could have done 75 take away 55, you could have done it like this, so you'd have got 5 take away 5 is 0, 7 take away 5 is 2, so you could have got 20, you could have done a number line, so you put 55 at one end and 75 at the other end. And you could have done your jumps, so you could have done 5 to 60. 10 to 70, sorry guys, tricky on my laptop, and then a 5 to 75, and then added those up, and your answer still would have been 20. However, you did that, that is brilliant. Okay, how many tickets were sold on Tuesday and Wednesday? Okay, so you're looking at Tuesday and Wednesday. How many tickets were sold all together? Have a go at that, come back when you're ready. Okay, so we need to add Tuesday and Wednesday ticket sales together. So 30 add 45, so 0 add 5 is 5, 3 add 4 is 7, so your answer is 75. Okay, well done. Okay, complete the sentences below. So the average water intake during PE for Tom, Jess, Ali and Faye. And they are in millilitres. So we need to complete the sentences. On average, Tom drinks how many millilitres more water than Ali? Okay, have a go. Pause me while you do that and come back when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully you've got that Tom drinks 70 ml of water because the bar is in between the 60 and the 80 and that must be 70 okay and Ali is in between the 40 and the 60 so she must drink 50. So like we did on the last slide you could do your column subtraction you could do a number line you might just know the answer so work it out and the difference is 20 millilitres okay hopefully you all got that one. Okay, and then we're looking at Jess and Faye. So Jess drinks how many millilitres less water than Faye? So Jess drinks 40. Oh, sorry. And Faye drinks 60. So again, you could do your column subtraction, your number line, and hopefully you'll get that your answer is 20. Before we go on to your do it, I just want you to have a little look at this. So it says Kate says there are 20 more votes for consoles than phones. So we've got key stage to choose favourite gadgets. We've got laptop, console, tablet, phone, and then the numbers at the bottom are 0 to 120. You need to decide if she is correct. So I want you to have a look and then think, is she correct? Okay, let's have a look. So if we look here at phones, it's on the 80. So phones got 80 votes. Now the console got in between 80 and 100. So it got 90 votes. So there were not 20 more votes for console. She's incorrect. There were actually 10 more because 90 take away 80 is 10. Okay. Right, guys. So for your do it today, you have got a pictogram there. You need to decide how many more points does the Sycamore team have than the Ash team? How many points do Beach and Oak teams have altogether? How many more points do Ash need to be equal to Oak? And then finally, you need to complete the sentences below. So chocolate beat vanilla by how many votes? And strawberry was so many votes behind the winner. Okay, if you're stuck with that, you're not sure what you're doing, please send me an email and I'll go through that with you. 
if you whiz through your do it and you want a bit of an extra challenge, there is a do it extra challenge today. So you need to fill in the missing data. Now, for this, you can just write them in your books. The amount more you need. If you don't want to draw it out, that is fine. So you are told that there are more poppies than sunflowers, but less poppies than roses. And there are five more lilies than roses. OK, so you need to work out how many need to go in the poppies and the lilies part of the table. Good luck. And finally, for today, you'll secure it. Jessica says there are 20 more parsnips than leeks. Is she correct? Convince me. OK, if you're stuck, go back to the reasoning problem we did all together earlier and that should help. Any problems, send me an email, guys, and we'll go through the answers tomorrow. Good luck. Hi, everyone. Here we are with our writing lesson for Monday, the 18th of May. And we're going to start like we always do with our warm up activity. So today's warm up activity is all about it's OK. And we're going to be looking at this for the whole of the week. OK, because lots of time in our writing, we don't know whether it's it's without an apostrophe or it's with an apostrophe okay so this is our clue to help us remember which one it is okay so if we need to say it is in the sentence and we're shortening that we're contracting that to it's then we need the apostrophe if it's something that belongs to it then we don't need the apostrophe at all so what i would like you to do is when we're looking at our sentences this week is try and work out when you say the sentence if it needs to be it is or if it needs to be it's if it should be it is then you're going to use the apostrophe if it shouldn't be it is you're going to use the normal it's without an apostrophe okay let's have a little go and a practice together today okay so it's here to remind you again as we go through so it's without an apostrophe means belonging to the crab hid in its shell the shell belongs to the crab it's a possessive one. It doesn't need the apostrophe. It's with an apostrophe means it is or it has. So it's time to go home. The way I can check this is I can replace this it's with it is and see if it still makes sense in the sentence. It is time to go home. Yeah, that's one that I need. So I need an apostrophe to show it. OK, if we look at this sentence, it doesn't work. So the crab hid in it is shell doesn't sound right so it's the one without the apostrophe so that's what we want to be checking it with does it work with it is if it does it's an apostrophe if it doesn't work with it is then it's the one without so our activity for this morning for our warm-up and what's going to happen on this week is you're going to copy the sentence and choose it's or it's with a cat with an apostrophe to complete each of these three sentences the kangaroo carried its new baby it's nice to sing carols at Christmas. The station sounded its alarm. OK, have a little go. Copy out the sentence, put the right it's in it and then come back to me and we will go through the answers. Pause the video now. OK, brilliant. I hope you managed to work it out and tested that it is in each of the sex sections here. Let's have a look at our answers. OK, so the kangaroo carried its new baby. So we've got a belonging to here. The baby belongs to the kangaroo. So we don't need an apostrophe. It's just I-T-S, no apostrophe. OK, it's nice to sing carols at Christmas. Could we replace this with it is? Let's check. It is nice to sing carols at Christmas. Yep. So that means it's a contraction and it means there's some letters missing. So we do need the apostrophe there. OK, the last one, the station sounded its alarm. The alarm belongs to the station. So we don't need an apostrophe because that would sound strange. The station sounded it is alarm doesn't make sense. OK, so mark those in your book. If you didn't get them all right, try and go back to them. Have a little think about them now. We've discussed them and we're going to do more of these as we go through the week this week. So you get really confident on it or it is. OK. So moving on to our writing task for today, we're going to be looking at conjunctions and we use conjunctions in our writing to make our writing more cohesive. OK, so what I want you to do is have a little think because there's lots of big words in that objective for today. What is a conjunction? Can you remember what a conjunction is? And do you know what cohesive means? I'll give you a clue. It's a little bit like 
adhesive, if you've heard of that one before, okay? Pause the video, have a think, and then come back to us and we'll go through the answers. Okay, brilliant. Hopefully, you've remembered a little bit about what a conjunction is. So I always tell people that conjunctions are junctions in the road, okay? So a junction is part of the sentence. It's the part of the sentence that joins our clauses together, okay? So conjunctions can be used for joining all sorts of things, but they always wear a place where two parts of a sentence join together. Okay, so if we have a look at the little examples that we've got here, you've got joining two adjectives. Ned is a fast but unmotivated horse. We've got our two adjectives here and they're joined by our conjunction. You can also use conjunctions to join two nouns, two names of things together. He eats apples and grass. Okay, here are our two nouns and they're joined together with an and. And it's the third example that we're going to be looking at really closely today because we're going to be looking about joining clauses in sentence. Now remember that a clause in a sentence is a group of words that we join together to make a sentence. Okay, a, join, a group of words that make sense on their own. So we've got here, he will win the race or he will give up quickly. So we're joining two parts of the sentence, two independent clauses with a conjunction in the middle. Now, cohesive, I said to you, means a little bit, um, as this little clue I gave you was about adhesive. So adhesive means is a glue, essentially. Um, so a glue joins two things together. It keeps things stuck together. It helps them, okay? And cohesive is very similar. It's not, it's like the glue in a sentence or a glue in a text altogether because it means that you can join your work together and make it flow a little bit better. Help it to make sense. Help the reader to understand what they're reading because each bit joins on and joins up with the next one and it all makes sense. We're going to explore both of these in a little bit more detail as we go through our activities today. And then we're going to be using them in our writing as we move through the week. So it's really important that we get a good understanding of what conjunctions are and why we use them to join these parts of our sentences together. OK, so first of all, let's have a little look at clauses. OK, so a clause, like I said to you, is a group of words that makes sense on its own. OK, it has an active verb and a subject within our sentence. So let's have a little look and say if this, we can explain this. So the subject is the doer of the verb. It can be a noun or a pronoun. So in this sentence, we've got Harry. Harry is doing something. Harry looked around in amazement. So our verb is looked and our subject is Harry. Okay, they stepped through the archway. Well, the verb is the easiest one to spot, isn't it? Because it ends in that ED, so it's a regular verb. So we've got stepped, stepped, who stepped? They stepped. So the subject of our sentence is they, okay? The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons, okay? What's happening in the sentence? What's active? What's the verb? Shone. Who or what did it? The sun, okay? So our sun is our subject and shone is our verb, okay? And the last one of these, a cobbled street twisted out of sight, okay? Now, you have to be careful with this one because we've got two EDs, so we have to look at what the verb is, okay? So cobbled is describing the street, so that's an adjective, that's not it. So it's twisted is our verb, and the, what twisted? The street twisted, okay? So hopefully that makes sense about what a clause is. Okay, so moving on then. How do we join these clauses together? How do we make our sentences a little bit longer, a little bit more flowing, more cohesive? How do we join our sentences together? So conjunctions are joining words, okay? They help to add more detail by joining new clauses to other clauses. Generally, they explain when, why, or where something happened, okay? So they're adding detail and information. Harry looked around in amazement. This was the one we've just had. The verb is looked. The subject is Harry, that's our first clause, that's our main clause. When did it happen? We can use a conjunction to add this detail. So when did Harry look around in amazement, okay? Let's have a little look. Harry looked around in amazement when they stepped through the archway. So we're joining both of those clauses together. 
Harry looked round in amazement when they stepped through the archway. And then we make one sentence, which is a compound sentence, with two clauses joined by a conjunction. Okay? Super. Okay, the choice of the conjunction changes the meaning of the sentence. So, what we might do is say, Harry looked around in amazement before they stepped through the archway. Or we could say, Harry looked around in amazement until they stepped through the archway. And all of those change the meaning of the sentence. They change when the thing happened. Okay, let's have a look a little bit more detail at that. So different conjunctions help us to add different types of information. We talked about it telling us where and when something happened. But different conjunctions help us to do this. So if we want to know when something happened, we might use the conjunctions before, after, when, while, as, or until. If we want to know why or explain why something happened, we might use because or as or so. If you want to tell your reader where something happened, you might use where or wherever. Let's have a look at these, okay? So our first clause is I am worn. Our verb is worn. What or who is worn? I, okay? So we've got our verb and our subject. So that's our first clause, our main clause, okay? And we can add and show when we are worn. So I am worn until I declare which house a student should join. If we want to look at why the hat is worn, we could say I am worn because I can sense where you belong. And if we want to say where the hat is worn, I am worn where students are judged. Okay, so we can add all sorts of different conjunctions and change our sentences. So does it matter which conjunction that you choose? Malfoy grinned, Gryffindor won the cup. Okay, so think about what kinds of conjunctions you might put in this space. Malfoy grinned, Gryffindor won the cup. Okay, Malfoy grinned before Gryffindor won the cup. Okay, let's change the meaning of our sentence. Malfoy grinned until Gryffindor won the cup. Oh, that tells us that Malfoy wasn't very happy when Gryffindor won the cup. So that's changed the sentence completely. Let's have another one. Malfoy grinned, Gryffindor won the cup after. Malfoy grinned after Gryffindor won the cup. So this tells me that Malfoy was happy because they won the cup, whereas this one was telling me he wasn't happy when they won the cup. So the sentence changes completely. They all have a different meaning. So on to our activity for today. Uh, what I'd like you to do is copy out the sentences and I want you to hunt for the conjunction in these sentences, okay? So you're going to look for the first clause, the main clause, Hermione smiled with satisfaction. You're going to look for the conjunction, while, and you're going to look for the next clause, aiming the curse at Draco. And what I'd like you to do is rewrite the sentences out and underline that conjunction to show me that you know where those different clauses are. There's a bit of an extra challenge with this today, is you might want to take the sentence and change that conjunction to change the meaning of the sentence. So an example here is Hermione smiled with satisfaction while aiming the curse at Draco. We could change that by changing the conjunction to after and make it Hermione smiled with satisfaction after aiming the curse at Draco. Okay, so here are our sentences. All the ones from Harry Potter, because we're carrying on that theme from last week. Hermione made a disappearing spell while Professor Snape wasn't looking. Harry Potter released Hedwig because Dudley hurt him. Ron skidded along the floor when it was wet. Dudley's shirt buttons popped open as he ate his roast dinner. And the snake slithered quickly because he was hurt. And if you need a little bit more help with spotting those conjunctions, there is a list of conjunctions in your pack today that you can use to help you spot them. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video, write out the sentence, spot the, claw, the conjunction for me, and then I'd like you to have a go at writing out a different sentence, or the same sentence, sorry, with a different conjunction to change the meaning, okay? If you want an extra challenge after that, I've got something extra to go on to today, but this is the main activity for today. So pause the video and write out these five sentences. Good luck.
Brilliant. I hope you got on all right with those today. Um, we're going to have a look at the little answers now. So as we go through, let's have a look if you spotted these conjunctions correctly. So the conjunction in the first sentence, Hermione made a disappearing spell. Professor Snape wasn't looking. Our conjunction, our joining word is while. Okay. Harry Potter released Hedwig. Dudley hurt him. Those are our two clauses. Our joining word is because. Ron skidded along the floor. It was wet. Our joining word is when. Dudley's shirt buttons popped open. He ate his roast dinner. Our joining word, our conjunction is as. And the snake slithered quickly. He was hurt. The conjunction here is because. We're explaining why he did what he did. Okay? So if you want a little bit of an extra challenge today, we're going to go on to how start thinking about the order of clauses in our sentences and whether it makes a difference if we put the subordinate clause first or the main clause first and what we have to do to make sure our sentences make sense. So when we add an extra clause, it adds information to the main clause. OK, Harry looked around in amazement was the one we looked at when they stepped through the archway. OK. That's our subordinate clause. So that one tells us more about this one. This one's the main part of a sentence. And that one adds the detail. It adds the information. And it's joined with our conjunction. Okay. The main clause can go at the beginning of a sentence, like here. Or it can go at the end of the sentence. And our subordinate clause can go at the beginning. But you'll remember when we were working with our fronted adverbials, if we put the subordinate clause at the beginning of the sentence, we need something else so let's have a little look so let's move it around when they stepped through the archway harry looked around in amazement what do i need here to make this sentence make sense when they stepped through the archway harry looked around in amazement so there's my subordinate clause there's my main clause and we've changed the impact of the sentence okay so you were absolutely right if you managed to spot there that we need a comma when we're using the subordinate clause first. So we're going to have a look at that now. So if you had a clause, if you had a clause after the main clause, you don't normally need a comma. Okay, so if the main clause starts the sentence, you don't normally need the comma. Harry's broomstick snapped as he crashed into the tree. But if we use the subordinate clause first, as he crashed into the tree, Harry's broomstick snapped, we do need the comma because we've changed the emphasis of the sentence and we need to know the parts are linked. The comma tells you to say the first clause differently. We use a slightly different voice. As he crashed into the tree, Harry's broomstick snapped. We use a different voice and that's what tells the reader what to do. Okay. So if you want to have a little go at the extra challenge today, have a little look and read these sentences and think about which ones need a comma. Okay. So Harry's broomstick snapped where it stuck in the branch. The class cheered when they heard the lesson was cancelled. Because he was nervous, Ron's trem hands trembled. Before he sneaked out of the before she sneaked out of the dormitory, Hermione listened carefully. Okay? So think about what the main clause is. If the main clause is first in a sentence, we don't need a comma. If it's second in the sentence, we do need the comma. So have a little look, read the sentences. Try and spot which ones need the comma. You can just have a look on the screen or you can write them down. But come back to me when you think you know which of these two sentences need a comma and which two don't. Brilliant. Let's have a look at the answers then. Hopefully you spotted that the main clause was first here and the conjunction's in the middle. Harry's broomstick snapped where it stuck in the branch. The class cheered when they heard the lesson was cancelled. Again, conjunction in the middle, don't need a comma. Conjunction at the start of the sentence, because he was nervous, needs a comma after the clause. Because he was nervous, comma, Ron's hands trembled. And the same here, we've got a conjunction at the start of the sentence, so we're going to need a comma after that first clause. Before she sneaked out of the dormitory, Hermione listened carefully. We're going to have a look at more of this tomorrow as we go through. Um, but for today, that's the end of our writing lesson. Let's have a little look at connected curriculum. Uh, remembering that you've got a brand new challenge because it's the start of a new week for a connected curriculum this week. We're still on our World of Wonders topic. 
but this week's focus is on art and sculpture, okay? So we've got an essential activity for everybody to have a little look at this week. So this is our find out more activity. And this gives you some information about sculptures, about famous sculptures. Um, it's to go and visit the Tate Modern, um, which is a gallery, to go and explore some sculptures there. Um, you can learn about sculpting techniques. And then you've got a little quiz, a little question and answer thing to complete as well. Once you've had a little look at the essential activity and you know a little bit more about art and sculpture and why some of these sculptures are some of the wonders of the world, what you can then do is choose to show what you know in lots of different ways. So I've given you lots of art projects to do this week, so I'm hoping you'll really enjoy them. Uh, the first one is to create a tin foil sculpture. And that's in the style of Giacometti, okay? There's another one here to make some scar sculptures out of clay or cardboard. So to give you a little bit of a, a play with some different materials here. And there's a recipe for some um, salt dough there or Play-Doh if you would like to make your own clay. Okay, you've then got some information about Andrew Goldsworthy in your pack as well. And this is, he uses nature to create his sculptures, as you can see from this lovely stone sculpture here. So perhaps when you're out on your daily walk or you're in your garden, you can find some bits of nature and create your own sculpture, your own art using natural materials in the style of Andrew Goldsworthy. Or what you can do is research some, um, if you don't fancy the art projects this week, you can do some research about one of the famous sculptures that we've talked about, so the Statue of Liberty or Mount Rushmore or the Terracotta Army or the Angel of the North and find out who sculpted it, why they did it. Um, you can make a poster or a PowerPoint and you can explain to us what the sculpture's made from, who made it and why it's there and what it means. Um, so there's loads and loads to do this week if this is the option that you want to be choosing. Um, have a little search about, read about it in your pack um, and then make some decisions about what you want to do. And we'll be back with more learning tomorrow. See you soon guys, bye.